thank you for joining us this afternoon for um, our program, which is on submitting your best program proposal for the upcoming Akuai Conference and Expo that we're going to be having um, this year, June the 22nd through the 24th. Um, and let me just change slides here so I can um, intro both of us. So my name is Lori Sabata. I am the Akuai Professional Staff Leader for the Program Committee. I've been doing this for, I don't know, 10 or 11 years or something like that. So, um, and also, um, Dave, I'm going to let you um, kind of intro yourself too. And Dave and I will be kind of switching back and forth and um, talking about the programs today and how to how to submit your best program proposal. Sure, thanks, Lori. Hi, everybody. My name is David Grimes. I am an associate. I am the associate director for residential education at the New School in New York City, and I'm also the program admin um, as part of the leadership team of the program committee for Akuga Y. Yep, and um, as I mentioned before, Dave and I will be kind of switching on and off as we go through um, the different slides today. We will definitely have time um, at the end for questions and answers. Um, in fact, we don't have a huge amount of people on today, so um, I might just go ahead at the end and just kind of unmute folks, and then you can just answer questions live um, or ask questions live that way. Or we can use the chat box too. So we'll be monitoring the Q&A and you can just type your questions in and we'll answer any questions that you have. And we are recording this as well. So we're gonna take the recording of this and go ahead and post it on our website. Um, so that way, if you have any colleagues who might've missed it or you wanna go back and review something, you're definitely welcome to do that. But um, we're gonna show you actually in a little bit, we, we actually have a pretty robust, um, website that has a lot of this information on it already and we're just going to kind of be reviewing today how to um, go through some of those things but we'll have time to go through all of that so um just want to go through some or i guess dave you're going to go take this slide and go through the milestones sure absolutely so conference milestones and dates so um the call for programs is open it is live so we are very excited that we have um we've opened we're ready for submissions Proposals are gonna be due Friday, February 26th. And it's our intention right now notifying presenters in early April. So during the course of that time, the, um, the program committee are reviewing all the proposals. They are making their selections and slotting for the conference itself so that we're able to notify presenters in early April. The conference right now, our conference dates are looking at June 22nd to 24th. And registration will open in February. So check akuhoi.org for registration information on the conference itself. So just want to kind of overview um, what we're going to be actually this is your slide too, Dave I keep talking over you and just taking that away from you I'm sorry. No, totally fine. So this <laughs> is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to give you a delegate profile of our virtual summit from 2020. Obviously, as folks may know, or some folks may not know, we did have to uh, transition from having um, the Akuhawai Conference and Exposition in person to a virtual summit. Um, so we're going to give you a snapshot of what those delegates look like. We're going to go over content and audiences. Um, we're going to talk about the submission review process. Um, Lori's going to walk you through a demo of how to submit an actual proposal. And we're also going to describe for you the different program types that you'll see on a program proposal itself. Yes, thank you. And then also before we move on into the next couple of slides, which are those um, sort of profile overview slides with some of the data on it that Dave's going to do, I wanted to go ahead and um, probably talk a little bit about a big question that is on a lot of people's minds thinking about, okay, I'm going to submit this program. Um, this conference is planned for June. Um, what is that going to look like? Are we going to be, you know, last year, as Dave just mentioned, um, we ended up um, quickly having to um, switch gears and move into or pivot into a, a virtual conference mode, which so, so many or actually I can't, probably everyone did that um, last year. Um, so we are um, kind of, I feel comfortable at this point saying that I would plan for probably a virtual mode. Um, that has not been um, you know, firmly established yet. That is not um, um, completely, you know, um, public information yet. But right now, um, I would say to you, when you are thinking about submitting a proposal, um, I would think of it in a virtual format at this time. So we'll definitely keep everyone informed as those negotiations roll along. We're definitely actively working with negotiating with the Columbus Convention Center, um, because as you know, we were um, 
contracted to have that event in Columbus this year. Um, and while we would like that to still happen, um, obviously we're very closely monitoring as everyone is the situation that's going on with COVID right now. And of course we wanna make sure that we do the, um, the right thing there. So, um, uh, so just to kind of you know recap that a little bit, when you're thinking about your proposal, the way you're framing it, I would think of it in a virtual format at this time. So I hope that helps clear up any questions there might be about that and you know, and then I'm able to answer that question to the best of the ability with the information that I have at this time. Um, so if there's any other um, questions about that or clarifications I can make, we can, we can address those as well. So I hope that that's helpful. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move into the data slides. Awesome. So we're just going to give you a snapshot of what the data looked like from our attendees at the virtual summit. I will tell you from reviewing this data, it is very much representative of the attendance that we typically get at the Aku Hawaii conference and exposition when we have it in person, which is a good thing. Um, but it should help you if you were exploring doing a proposal, the audience that you can potentially that you can potentially uh, see um, and who you want to gear your material to. So this one goes through the education level. You can see the majority, 71% uh, of the attendees did have a master's degree um, with the second um, highest percentage after that at 17 being those with a doctoral degree, followed by those that had um, a four-year college degree, a BA or a BS count. So primarily we're looking at folks that do have a master's degree or higher with some folks that, were, that are strictly at the bachelor level. We typically, those folks are our our hall director staff, um, kind of assistant hall director staff, if you will. Um, looking at membership of you know, the membership type of those that were in attendance, a large majority were institutional members. Um, and we did have a pretty decent chunk of those who were corporate members as well. Um, and it's always great when we see our corporate, our corporate friends in sessions learning right along with institutional members as well. So that's something that we always are, you know, very excited about as well with 3% being those who have chosen an individual membership. Um, region, you can see um, the pie is almost, almost pretty equidistant, um, pretty much large representative from all over, all over the United States plus international. Um, it does look like the largest uh, chunk we have at 23%, I believe is the AIMHO region if I'm looking at the colors correctly, followed by the Glucuho but that can always vary from year to year. Um, but you do see that we do have representation all across the US and even abroad as well, which is very much exciting. And what a Kuhawai does represent, and especially the I in a Kuhawai. Functionally, um, you can see that we do have a large kind of varying of positions. We do have a decent chunk of CEO, senior executive presidents, um, those at the director level, um, as well as you know, some students in there. So we pretty much run, you know, the gamut in terms of a lot of different positional types that do show up at the at the conference. Cool. All right. Thanks, Dave, for going through those. Hope that was helpful to, you know, kind of, you know, again, when you're framing your proposal, thinking about who's in the room, who could potentially be in the room, be it in person or virtual, um, when you're framing your proposal. So we wanted um, to talk a little bit about our process for um, gathering topics this year and the way that we um, wanted to try to focus some of our um, some of our efforts a little bit more um, this year. You know, typically what we do is we have our core competency areas, and I'm going to go through those in a little while and talk about those and um, and obviously we, we still have our core curr curriculum, um, but we wanted to see if we could try to help some of our um, folks who are thinking about submitting programs um, focus a little bit more on exactly what kinds of topics underneath those core competencies um, might be most useful and beneficial to our membership um, right now. And so we wanted to try to put that member voice into that um, a little bit more um, than we have, I think, in the past couple of years. So we went out with a couple of phases um, that we did. And the, the call for programs, obviously, as you notice, is going out much later um, than it has been. Usually we open up our call for programs in October, and this year we're opening it in February. We've kind of done that by design for a couple of different reasons. Um, 
So that was intentional. Um, again, trying to narrow and focus the topics. Um, so the phase one that we did was kind of a like a topic survey, and you may have seen this or participated in it and saw where, um, you know, we went out and we just asked, you know, what are topics that you would be interested in either presenting on or learning about at this year's conference. And so we got a really good response to that. And then the phase two that we did of that was sort of a crowdsourcing where we took those topics, kind of put them out there and then said, um, please rank these, you know, of these, which ones are most important. And so that was interesting. And we're going to walk through that a little bit. Um, so when we asked that phase one, we said, well, what topics would you like to see at the conference? This is what we got back. And if you are familiar with core competencies and the core curriculum, these are really obviously fall under um, any one of those um, different 22 areas. Um, but we were just interested to see where the focus um, would fall out. And so this is what we got back and um, thought that it was um, very interesting. Um, to see. So when you, um, we'll go through this a little bit later, but when you're actually submitting your program on the form, um, you'll actually be asked to submit under one of these topics. And then there also is another category as well, because we recognize that obviously there will be other topics that um, people will be interested in presenting on and hearing about at the conference other than just these. But we wanted to try to give people a little bit more focus um, this year. So I hope that this is helpful. Um, we put a lot of thought and um, time into this and then when we went and asked, um, you know, I mentioned the phase two and we said, well, um, of those topics, which are most relevant? And so this is kind of how things um, shook out. So I find it interesting that we have occupancy management and accommodations and accessibility sort of leading um, the average on the bottom of the graph there. Um, so it's just another data point that I think kind of helps us narrow things a little bit. And, and I wanted to frame too, and, and this is something that Dave and I kind of talked about when we were talking about doing this webinar, to make sure that people, we know that COVID is a real thing. So we wanted to make sure that um, we were very intentional about recruiting topics that were outside of pandemic related things, as well as, you know, obviously we know there's going to be a lot of topics um, related to COVID, but also give opportunities for non-COVID related topics um, as well. And, you know, it would be, uh, you know, I think if anyone has been at, at, at attending the state of profession, it's just interesting to, to see how people are thinking about the impact of COVID and how for many years to come, in how many ways this is going to impact everything that we do for for such a long time, and so there's no no um, getting out of that. But at the same time, there are other um, topics that need to be addressed as well. Dave, did I cover that? Um, okay. Absolutely. Yep. Totally agree with you. All right, so um, so that was just a little bit, a couple of slides about some of our methodology that we used this year to try to arrive at um, some focus areas. Um, we also asked for other topics. Um, so when we said what topics would you, so when we, when we did the crowdsourcing, we also said, hey, you know, please rank these things. And then sort of a second opportunity for other topics. And this is what was, um, well, this is what came out of that. And again, this won't be the last time that you see this information because it's, um, it's actually up on our website. Um, so we'll have that as well. And obviously anyone, you know, I'm going to put our emails in the chat. Um, so if you have questions, you can e email either Dave or I. Um, you can find the information on the website. There will be this webinar too as a resource as well. So um, don't feel like this is the last time that you'll see this information. But um, you know, I'm not going to read through the different bullets because you can read it on the screen. Um, but this, this is what um, came out of that. And I think it's important to note too, um, just going off of Lori said, some of these are going to spam multiple different topics. Um, if on a previous slide you saw diversity, equity, and inclusion, and depending on how one may want to submit a proposal related to staffing, those things can go very much hand in hand depending on the lens in which your proposal is looking at. So I would not get so caught up in the, okay, it's just this one topic, because we also recognize when reviewing proposals that they can spam multiple different buckets in multiple different areas. But that's the richness of our field is that these topics aren't so siloed that we can look through a lot of our different topics with different lenses and that's totally fine. Yep, that's a good point. Thanks, Dave, for um, adding that in. 
Um, I'm going to move on now to the core curriculum. And so I've mentioned this in and out a couple of times um, as we've been talking. Um, so if you're not familiar with the core curriculum and the content areas, basically, um, you know, the core, curr core curriculum and, and these areas were developed um, as areas. So it's it's information that camping housing professionals basically need to know. And there's 12 different areas and then there's sort of sub areas underneath that. So as I mentioned before, um, and we're going to list these again on the next page so you can see them. And they're also on our website. So it won't be the last time you see this. But um, if you really you know think back to those emerging topics and look at these categories and subcategories, um, they really roll up underneath these. Um, so when you're something to keep in mind when you're submitting your um, proposal and you're you know submitting under one of the topic areas that we talked about earlier, we're gonna also be asking you to apply a core content area or um, um, domain to it as well. So, and you'll actually have three different chances to do that because a lot of topics will have more than one content area that applies to them. So this year we've provided a primary, secondary, and tertiary um, area that core content area that you can apply to your proposal. And that really helps us um, later on um, as a committee when we're going through and we're reviewing these, when we want to group things together and look at things like, well, how many do we have, you know, under crisis management? How many do we, we try to balance things. And using these core content areas is a great way for us to do that. So it's actually pretty important. Um, we really do look at that. And I know that Dave's been a reviewer for um, quite a while um, before joining us as admin on the program committee. And so I know that as we kind of walk through some of the more of the details of that, um, I know that Dave has a lot to add to that from his experience as a reviewer. Um, so so those, that's what I wanted to say about the content areas. Um, I didn't want to spend a ton of time on it, um, but it is it is an important thing. Um, yeah, target audience. So jumping into target audience, so when you're starting to think about who you're gearing your proposal to, who you want to present to, um, one of the key principles in adult learning is to meet individuals where they are. Um, so we talk about, in the Hawaii, we talk about that as career trajectory or career phases. Um, so we have a number of different opportunities within the association that target specific stages of career. So if you're familiar with NHTI or STARS College, those are for very set stages of someone's career, whether it's our paraprofessional staff or whether it's those who want to transition into a senior housing officer role. We also have um, different events that are geared more towards somebody's functional area, like the facilities conference or business operations. Um, so in conference proposal, you'll see this as target audience. So the choices that you can see on a proposal will be senior leadership, mid-level seasoned, as well as mid-level emerging professionals, you have your advancing professionals that have about three to seven years of experience, new professionals at zero to three years, and then our paraprofessional staff who were encompassing undergraduate students, but also graduate students. It's important that when you can that you consider your target audience when building your presentation um, and that you accurately select the level of the content presented. And I will tell you as a reviewer, as a former reviewer and review coordinator who kind of oversaw a bucket process, that's one of the things that we look at in particular of what is this proposal? How is it geared towards this specific population level? As well as, is this something that an SHO, a mid-level, a new professional can really benefit from? Um, we get so many amazing pre proposals and we're very excited when we get to read through them all. But we do make, it is a very difficult and challenging time for us to kind of look through all of those and make sure that what we're getting fits the target audience in which they say that that proposal is for. So something to kind of really think about as you're crafting your idea and thinking about if you're doing something related to XYZ topic, how can you put it in a lens that an SHO would benefit the most from it or a mid-level professional or whatever population you're looking at? Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to move on to the submission and review process. So this is a part where we're going um, going to go over um, we're going to look at a proposal that um, from a few years back, just an example of one that has scored well, and we're just going to talk about some of the process of how we actually, um, what criteria we use, and, and just sort of the process of reviewing the programs. So we do have a um, 
really robust process that the committee uses and I won't go into all the detail of that but we have several rounds of review that we use it's an online system that we use we use scoring and numbers and comments and several rounds of filtering that we put the programs through before we arrive at our final slate of programs so just know that you know when you submit a program it is being very thoroughly looked at by different groups of people um, and i wanted to put up the main scoring criteria the scale the rubric i guess is the right word that is applied to the programs um, this is what we use this is how we score them um, in the first round and again this won't be the last time you see this, this is actually up on our website as well um, but we thought it was important for you to see how they're actually scored, what we use to do that. And again, I'm not going to read through them all, but um, this is what is used. Um, so this is an example of a title and description that are actually, um, it's a very good title. It's a title that describes what it is. It's um, somewhat engaging, it's clear, it's 70 characters, I should say, Yes, it's 70 characters with spaces, um, doesn't contain a lot of, you know, we try to avoid a lot of characters with, when I say that, I mean like dot, you know, dots and, you know, colons and, you know, quotations and things like that. Um, try to keep it nice and clean. It's a title that, you know, is descriptive, says what it is. You can read the title and know what it's about. It's always kind of nice sometimes when you can do that and the title can be catchy too, but that's, that's tricky to do, but, um, that's always nice too. Um, the um, again, you know, it's kind of the same thing with the description. Says what it is, keeps it short, and there's lots of opportunity later, which we'll talk about in the outline, to really detail out, you know, the details, um, the behind the scenes of how you're actually going to do this program. So the description's not the place where you have to do that. You only have so many characters in this. I think it's 250 or something like that. So we like to keep these pretty short, knowing too that these things are going to show up well traditionally um, in a mobile app. So we try to keep them, you know, so they, they look nice there. You know, sometimes you have to think about how they're going to look on a title side or sign, you know, outside of a room and things like that too. So kind of like you know, less is more sometimes with these. Um, and again, the outline is the place to really go into detail. And we do look at those outlines. We're going to talk about that. Um, learning objectives are important. Um, obviously, we wouldn't have them if they weren't. Um, but really, everything that you, I think, are putting in this program should roll up under one of these learning objectives. So learning objectives really might almost be the one thing you might want to start with. You know, one, two, three. What are, what are you actually trying to accomplish with this program? What's the outcome? What are people going to walk away with? They don't have to be at all any kind of perfect, you know, five point, three point, five point learning objectives. We're not looking at that. Um, we're just wanting, we're looking to see what the takeaways are um, for the people that are going to be in the room. So, so these are important. Um, the outline. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this and I'm going to let Dave talk about it too, because then Dave's actually done the real work of looking at these. But what I'll say about the outline is, you know, don't skimp on the outline. It doesn't have to be this detailed and you probably can't even see it. <laughs> the text is really small, um, but I just wanted to at least give some sort of example. Um, I like this one because it, it, it really breaks down. It gets really granular. It's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the introduction. That's going to be two minutes. The learning objectives, I'm going to spend a minute on that. Then I'm going to spend 10 minutes doing this. Then, you know, so they really have thought through what they're going to do. And, and that's important for a lot of reasons, because I know sometimes when we're, we're talking about these things and, and we, we read this, we're like, oh, I really like this program. But it's like, how are they going to do this in 50 minutes? You know, and we think to ourselves, there's no way. Um, and so the outline shows, oh, there's a way. This is how we're going to do it. Um, and it gives that type of description. I think it's also um, good because sometimes we get a couple of programs or a lot of programs that seem really similar. And then when we get those out and we look at those and we're like, oh, which, you know, how do these differentiate? How does one stand out against another? Um, and sometimes we'll go back and we'll like, read the outline. You know, so we spend lots of time with these. Um, I know Dave has some things he wants to say about it too. I agree with everything Lori said. I think a couple of things to think about is that balance, there's a balance between being too specific and too general. You want to be specific enough that the reviewers, the review coordinators, everybody that's on the committee that's reviewing these 
has a really great sense of what you're doing, what are the engagement activities that you're doing with folks who are in attendance to show that level of engagement that it's not just them sitting and listening, but not lock yourself in to a set amount of time that you can't maneuver or change things up, especially if there's feedback that comes from the program committee. Um, I think it's incredibly important that you are showcasing ways in which you're gonna get the audience involved and trying to hit one last point with that one. Yeah, and especially if you are talking about an institutional specific program or initiative that you created, a big thing that we all look for is how does this now um, transition to other schools? So if you're at a large private school, I would really wanna see in its outline you taking time to talk about how a small public school or a community college could benefit from the same initiative or program, because then that shows how we're able to take this project or this initiative and span it out so that a wide variety of our members can actually benefit from that knowledge and see it applicable to their campuses. So when you're doing that, um, when you're doing the outline, just really think through those things. The more information you can give us, the better. Agreed. Thanks, Dave. All right, so, um, all right, so the rationale, you know, why was that a good topic? I mean, there's lots of them we could have picked, you know, to 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 sort of showcase and walk through um, as an example, but, you know, the topic is relevant, um, unique, it seemed to identify a topic that's needed. I don't know how many times I, I see that in the comments sometimes um, from the reviewers, they'll say, this is really needed. This is something we need. And that's that's kind of a big thing. So if you can hit that, um, I think that's really important. Um, and as I described before, the title's descriptive of what the presentation will be about, and so was the the description or the summary. Um, not campus specific. I know we say that, and I think what we really mean when we say camp, what we mean by you know don't make it campus specific it doesn't mean you can't use examples from what happened on your campus or something you know, an experience or something like that. It's just, I think what we want to do is show how that will be relevant at other places. Is that true, Dave? Um, I think that's what we mean by don't make it campus specific. So we don't want people to think like you can't mention your campus or that, you know, you can't, you know, talk about what you did on your campus. It's just, I think you have then have to also show how that's going to be broadly, more broadly relevant um, to others in the room. Um, the outline, we talked about that a lot, about it being um, very detailed and what's actually going to happen, supports the learning objectives, um, and basically just meets all of that defined criteria that I showed you um, on the first slide when we started to go through this and just overall, you know, really well thought out and thorough um, is what we're looking for. So I hope that that was helpful. Um, I keep looking over to see if there's any questions and um, none yet. So maybe we'll have some towards the end. Um, so I wanted to do a bit of a demo. So I'm going to kind of move away from this slide deck for a little bit. And I'm going to go to the website um, because this is going to go out. And if you re are you still seeing the screen share, um, Dave, or do I need to reshare it? You nope, see you're the good. website. You're okay, good. That was um, before I go on and on, and people are looking at my inbox or something like that instead of <laughs> instead of the website. Um, so, um, if you get connections newsletter, that's going out or at, well went out at one o'clock. So you'll see the call for um, you know big announcement there. Call for programs is open. State bench is going to be open through the end of this month through the twenty sixth, I believe. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to put this um, link here also in the chat. So let me just do that now. I'll send that to everyone. Um, okay, good. So you should see that in the chat. That's the link to this specific page. This has a lot of the information on it that I showed you in some of the slides and where I kept saying it's not the last time you're going to see this because you can find it on this website. We kind of designed this website. We wanted it to be sort of like your one stop place where you would go to just sort of find everything. So on here, you're going to find um, obviously, you know, um, just some information that sort of um, talks about 2021 in general. Um, this proposal assistance guide is a PDF, and what it this is important. I would definitely download this first 
because it sort of gives you an idea. You know how sometimes when you open up a form and you start filling the form out and you think to yourself, I wish I would have seen this form before I started typing in it because now I have to go and gather this and I have to think about that. And, you know, this is sort of your sort of cheat sheet that kind of tells you what the form is going to ask for. And so you can think about it ahead of time because I think it's really important when anytime you're filling out a form online, I just don't trust it. I mean, I would just rather know what I have to I'm going to have to be asked ahead of time. I would rather do it on a Word document or something like that. And then when I'm going to go submit the form, just cut and paste it in there and hit submit. So you don't have to worry about a timing out or some weird tech voodoo happening. I, I hate for, I feel so bad for people sometimes when they've sat and typed everything into this form, got it just how they want it. And then internet goes down or the form crashes or um, that shouldn't happen. But you know, technology sometimes can just do that to you. So I would just, um, to be safe, I would click this link, it'll download a PDF, and it will um, tell you what's going to be in the form. And it kind of breaks it down to and gives you information about things like, you know, what's it going to be like when I try to, you know, type presenters in, what's the best way to do that. Um, so, so I would definitely look at this assistance guide. That's what it's there for. Um, over this gray box in this area over here is sort of like where we try to put, you know, milestone dates, reminders, links to things. Um, so the Presenter Service Center, if you're not familiar with this, this is a portal. So what happens is you submit your proposal. Um, you know, we close those on February 26th. We go through all the process that we just talked about for the last 20 minutes or so, selecting the programs, and then we announce the status through this portal. And the Presenter Service Center is how you access that. It's kind of like a, a rooming portal or a housing portal of some sort. You know, you log in and it'll say like, status is going to come out in you know three days or something like that and so it'll it'll keep you informed and then when we release those you'll be able to log in and you'll be able to see if your proposal was um, accepted it could be an alternate or it might be not accepted and then your feedback will be in there and all kinds of different um, information if it was accepted you'll confirm that and just everything sort of happens in that presenter service center so you want to keep this link um, because this is sort of your one-stop shop for all of these things this is the link for submitting your proposal so when you're got all your things together you've read this assistance guide and you're ready to go submit your proposal you just click right on this link the form will pop up and then you should be good to go when you're you have the opportunity to save your proposal as a draft and i put this link here because it's hard to find the draft um, we have lots of people who have difficult i would have a hard time finding it if i didn't have this link so i would definitely keep this handy because if you decide you, you get halfway through and you decide to save it and not submit it yet and you want to go back to it and then edit it and then eventually suppose you want to go you have a question you want to ask one of your presenters you can save it as a draft and then you can access it again using this link and then go finish it up and then submit it so that's what that link's for so these are all really um really important links here um we talked about, um, I think um, Dave went over this slide um, with us and talked about um, level of experience. I think we called it target audience um, on the slide, but it's the same thing. Um, the session types, um, we're going to have um, an intro session, 50 minutes. We're going to have our round tables, which is, I should talk about it a little bit if you're not familiar with it. So intro session would be basically your sort of, I don't want to use the word standard because I don't like that word, but it's basically where you have maybe one or two presenters on a topic. Um, round table is, and you have kind of like I'm doing now, this would be more like an intro session because I have slides and it's like a one to many, I'm presenting to you. Um, round table is a little bit more of like a discussion. So if you've ever been to one of those face-to-face -face, um, at ACE, it literally is a round, well, it doesn't have a table, I guess, but it literally is round. Um, we have the chairs in a circle and it's meant to be more of a conversational discussion on a particular topic that's led by a facilitator. Um, panels are also led by facilitators. Um, the distinction there, I think, is that um, you have a panel of presenters rather than maybe one or two presenters. Um, again, Dave, stop me if I've missed something or um, anything needs clarification. Nope. The topic, the topic areas, as I promised, the ones that we showed on that slide, those are here. They're on the form too. You'll be asked to select a topic area from a drop-down menu. Um, there's also going to be an other category. So if you want to submit on a topic area that isn't any of these, there's an other and then a fill-in um, that will explain what your category is. So you can make your own. Um, again, these are just designed to try to help you 
narrowed down what people said they wanted. Um, core competencies, this is a link to um, what we showed you earlier, it shows you all those core competencies. If you want to really drill down into those and, you know, read about um, what all the core competencies mean and all the detail that's there at that link. Um, here are some really good, and I definitely, now we've gone through some of this, you know, in this webinar, but probably worth a read again before you really go ahead and start submitting. I mean, we talked about the outline, um, you know, updating your profiles, um, you know, talks about um, presenters. I mean, just all kinds of information in here. Um, how to submit, again, it gives you the link again, how to submit, talks about downloading that PDF, uh, or it says a submission link at the top of this page. This is that PDF that I talked about at the top of the page. That's assistance guide that's really helpful. Um, definitely recommend reviewing that first. Um, this talks about what happens after I submit. You know, you'll go to the presenter service center that we talked about earlier. Um, the criteria um, talks about um, will you need to be registered to present? And the answer is yes, you will have to register to present um, or be a panelist or a, a panel facilitator or roundtable facilitator. But again, as I mentioned here, if that is a, an obstacle, please just contact me at that email below and we'll we'll discuss it. Um, these are other potential topics. I think these are kind of the topics that we sort of always have. I mean, these are general topics, not as specific as the ones that we um, have identified above, um, but just to help a little bit with, um, you know, developing some focus on what, what you might want to submit. And so that's basically the whole website that I went through very quickly, and I hope it wasn't too fast. But again, you've got the link in the chat, and you can go to it and just, you know, peruse it um, as you wish. Um, someone just pointed out that future conferences shows the June dates are the 12th through the 15th are different. So um, the ones that I showed, I think was it the 22nd through the 24th, those are correct. So thank you for pointing that out. I don't think we realize that those old dates are still on there, um, Mark. So I will, um, I will address that and we'll correct that. But thanks for pointing that out. Um, okay, I think that's everything as far as kind of demoing um, how to go ahead and submit. I could click on the um, link to take you to the form. Um, this is what it looks like. So you title, program summary, this is looking up a presenter. So it has an auto lookup um, there. Um, and learning objectives. This is another, this is actually links back to the website that we were just on. Um, the outline has a little WYSIWYG here, so you can kind of format it. You can, you can use uh, bullets or color, underline, whatever you want to do there. Um, this is the target audience, um, professional years in the field, um, what type of session that we just talked about a couple minutes ago. These are your topic areas. So you're gonna choose one or you can choose other and type here what your topic is. Um, and then you have three, you don't, you select a core competency, it makes you do one, it's mandatory. These are optional fields. So you don't have to apply three core competencies, but if you want to, you can. Sometimes it's necessary. And then it basically asks if this is a, a global focus program or not. You can either save the draft or when you hit the next button, um, that will take you on to submit the proposal. So that's, that um, I'm going to switch back to this. I think I really only had one one more slide um, left to go after that. No, it's starting me at the top. Hold on, let's not do that. Um, I think this is where we were. No, it's going to make me okay. Fine, we'll do this. You get a little preview of everything again in case you missed anything. I'm sure there's probably some much slicker way to do that, but I don't know what it is. Anyway, um, so program types, I think we talked a bit about these actually. Um, so all of the sessions, 50 minutes. I think last year for the virtual summit, we did 45, but we decided to go back to 50. So the 45 is just too short, especially with moderator time in there. And then sometimes we have you know sponsors and things like that too. Um, you'd be surprised how quickly 
45 minutes goes. So we bumped it back up to 50. Um, round tables, as I mentioned before, designed to be facilitated discussions. Um, they can be topics like wellness or engaging specific populations. Um, panels are also 50 minutes. A um, couple tips and tricks that may or may not be on the website, but you know, making a presentation unique, um, showing how you're going to include active participation. And we're going to have um, presenter training again this year. And I think it was our, our desire last year to have some more interactive type sessions. We wanted to have more peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, and we had to shift gears and make everything virtual. And that was a little bit difficult to do because not too many people had done online conferences at that point. But this year, I think we have some ideas on how um, we would like to see some more active participation. And I'm sure that you do too, because we spent a whole year on Zoom um, looking at what other people do. And there are ways with uses of video and some more experiential type things that we think we can incorporate into presentations to make them a little bit more active. And I know myself, I'm a little bit more comfortable using breakouts and um, getting people to have some peer to peer interaction than I was a year ago. So, um, so we're going to be looking for that again, ways to do that. Um, well developed outline, which we talked about, um, definitely multiple perspectives from different campuses. Um, wherever possible, um, providing data and outcomes that support your program, and then obviously timely issues and best practices. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, Dave. No, I think these hit on all the real, all the real good ones. I think you know, just honing in on the making making your presentation unique. I can recall even from the years that I've been reviewing, when you make it unique, and even the manner in which you're writing we get excited when we see something brand new of like, oh, we've never seen this before. So even if you're able to take something related to like RA selection, which we normally see a decent amount of stuff on, where you're able to approach it from a different way, those things are also really exciting to us. And those are ones that we're able to get really excited about if it gets accepted leading up to the conference as well. So thinking about how you can take a topic, you know, like living learning communities and things that we know are very common in our field and look at it from a very different approach, those things are always beneficial. Yep, definitely. Okay, the last slide, questions. So what has been the most interesting or impactful presentation that you have seen in your time reviewing proposals? Hmm, that's a great question. That is a great question. We're stumped. We've seen, uh, oh gosh. So many, I think for me where, when I've sat on both sides as a reviewer and review coordinator, the ones that have really gotten me excited of something new, there was a debate that was had a couple years ago regarding the RA group interview process and whether or not institutions should have it. And it weighed both the pros and cons of both sides of that. But it's something that a lot of schools think about and they talk about. But it was one of those things where it's like, we're actually hearing both sides of this. And those things are actually really exciting that it's not one sided, but it allows you to see a really diverse perspective over, you know, over something that you're like, oh, wow, you know, we've been talking about the group interview. So that's something that was that was that I can recall off the top of my head, it was really interesting. Anything that you're willing to kind of really look at as long as it has that spin, it has something that's unique about it, or if you're excited about it, because if you're excited about it, that's going to come through in your writing and that's going to have the reviewers even that much more excited about it as well. So just kind of thinking through that is always beneficial. You know, I'm happy to stick around in case anybody else has anything else, but thank you so much for being, you know, here at the webinar. We really appreciate it. Like Lori said, this is being recorded, so you're free to review it, but you also have our emails. So feel free to reach out to us with any questions you have, and thank you so much for being here, and hope you have a great day.